Crystal Deal With It focuses on bridging the gap between where you're at now and where you'd like to be. We'll explore wisdom and techniques from a wide variety of domains and industries and apply them to your unique challenges. I love developing frameworks, processes, and storytelling metaphors that enable personal and business growth. Through actionable next steps, we'll build momentum and confidence. My goal is to help you clear roadblocks, do more with what you have, and realize the potential of yourself and your team. So throw your challenges my way and Chris will deal with it. Welcome to episode 29 of Crystal Deal With It, balancing the benefits of our tech. First, an AI statement. All elements of this episode are products of the author, Chris Kreuter, made without any use of AI tools. So today's question, I'm struggling to find a balance between the benefits of all our technology with the downsides of their effects on me individually and on our society as a whole. Any advice? Since we're talking about balance, let's start with two stories about boats. Two centuries ago, an 87-foot whaling ship left New England. It sailed down the Atlantic, around the tip of South America, and then up to the Galapagos Islands. From there, they sailed west, cruising on the Pacific Ocean for whales. But one got its revenge. Rammed by a large whale, the boat was destroyed. The 20-man crew survived thanks to their rescue boats. Only problem was that they were over a 1,000 miles from land. For three months, they drifted. They resorted to eating their dead to survive. In the end, eight of the 20 made it home alive, and their tale would go on to inspire Herman Melville's epic novel, Moby Dick. Our second story is more recent. In March of 2023, a group of four sailed from those same Galapagos Islands, their destination, French Polynesia in the South Pacific. Enjoying lunch on the deck of their 44-foot sailboat, a sailor spotted a whale. Soon after, alarms started going off, and water was filling their boat. Another sailor sent out mayday signals, while two others prepped the lifeboats and packed emergency provisions. The fourth jumped in the water in snorkeling gear in an attempt to save the boat. Determining the boat was lost, the four sailors evacuated into their lifeboat. They carried everything they could take. Food, emergency supplies, bottled water, kettles, and even more water in pots. As the sailboat sank into the briny depths, over the next few minutes, the sailors rationed their provisions. A week's worth of water and three weeks' worth of food. The group was stranded but well prepared. Most in the group had extensive survival and maritime training. But more importantly, they had a satellite phone, satellite-enabled Wi-Fi hotspot, power bank, and emergency tracking beacons to regularly broadcast their location. Wi-Fi made it real handy for them to send a message to a friend they knew who was sailing 180 miles behind them along the same route. This is no joke. We hit a whale and the ship went down. The reply came quickly. We have a bunch of boats coming. We got you, brother. The Mayday signal at the start had already alerted the Peruvian and U.S. Coast Guards, as well as several nearby boats. A catamaran was closest, and within 10 hours of the whale's impact, all four sailors were rescued. I start with these stories since the comparison helps highlight the scope of our technological evolution in just the last two centuries. There's no denying that we live in an era of unheard of capability, relative wealth, and human longevity. With development seemingly proceeding at an exponential pace, what will the next two centuries bring? Like our asker, I have a hard time balancing these scales between benefits and detriments of all our technology. What technologies that seem so ubiquitous and necessary today will end up as obsolete as that whaling vessel? Which technologies are just a stepping stone for something greater and more meaningful to humanity? Could it be something we hold so high today, such as email or electric cars? These are unpredictable questions for unpredictable times. And I'm avoiding the rabbit hole of a technology pro-con list here, since it's not the point of the episode. This is about strategies to find some balance in the here and now. So here are four strategies that have proven helpful for me. One, unplug. Two, establish better filters to find the signals within the noise. Three, work on challenging long-term projects in a consistent manner. And four, continue to learn about technology. Unplug. There's no denying we live in an unnatural pace. With that comes the fear that the world's going to pass us by, triggering our natural fears of being left out, or worse, left behind. So in a world of constant distraction and cheap dopamine hits, is it any wonder that many of us feel this strange mixture of stagnation and overwhelming opportunity? It's a tricky thing to unplug from stuff, to unsubscribe from certain things that no longer provide value. You know, skip an episode of your favorite podcast, even mine, or a magazine because there's too many there piling up. Close your inbox for a few hours to do some deep work, even knowing that email is piling up for your return. You're never going to suffer from a lack of input. 
something or someone begging for your attention will always be there. And there's going to be times and places where it's worth being receptive to that. But we all need moments of quiet for doing work that matters, for reflection, and to enjoy with those we love. By unplugging, we allow ourselves the room to be more, to rise above the noise long enough to both decipher and send out clearer signals of what really matters. Which brings me to my next strategy. Number two, establish better filters to find those signals within the noise. Again, there's no shortage of amazing things to learn and do out there in the world. There's thrilling and informative books, inspiring live performances, cheering on your favorite team, the near infinite types of jobs and hobbies, even sitting in a quiet place of contemplation. In both the broad world of options and within any narrow field of activity, study, or work, there's going to be a lot of noise. There's hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, of writers, there's legal experts, there could even be noise amongst the historians of Slovakian interpretive dance. It's vital to develop filters to help you hone in on the valuable signals within all that noise. Your filters will help you discern who is credible, understand what qualifies them as credible, allow material through that helps you improve, clarify, and or challenge you, block out negative or detrimental information or feedback. And most importantly, good filters help you maintain a balance on the quantity of information you digest. This has a direct impact on your mental and physical capacity to do work. You can't create when you're consuming. It's also worth cautioning against confirmation bias. You want to be careful about what you define as noise. If you're simply tuning out important signals just because they don't align with your ideal view of the world, that's a problem. There is value in attempting to understand opposing viewpoints and form a more complete picture of how things really are, rather than holding firm to an incomplete view. There's a few places where filters have helped me find better signals. I subscribe to lower bias newsletters with more succinct content rather than tune into the rhetoric of the 24-7 news media cycles. There's a few of these out there. Personally, I'll recommend Roka News and Morning Brew. And there's a link to these in the show notes. Podcasts and Spotify versus the radio. You know, tuning into content providers that have earned my trust rather than passively letting whatever content radio personalities or DJs want to play. These apps also have great discovery tools to find new voices on topics that I care about. Reading books. Reading is a slower, intentional process. They both allow me to unplug from screens and relax the pace of information to one that's easy and enjoyable. I'll include listening to audiobooks while I do chores, but for me the preference is to sit down with a physical book. And lastly, unsubscribe buttons. It takes a lot to earn my permission, and even more to keep it. Start flooding me with emails, and I'll likely unsubscribe. Waste my attention with poorly prepared or repeated pleas to get me to buy something or take action, I'll definitely unsubscribe, no matter how much I liked your product or service in the first place. Not only does this strict unsubscribing policy streamline my email, it also ensures that what does end up in there has a higher hit rate in terms of value. Strategy number three, work on challenging long-term projects in a consistent manner. Aside from family responsibilities, writing books is the best thing that I do. It's not my day job, it's not what puts food on my table, but it's the single greatest product I produce. My words certainly won't last forever, but they'll last a lot longer than the greatest email I've ever written, my budget reports, or my employee reviews. And here's the thing, writing books is hard. There are points in this process with every book that absolutely suck, but I know that the end result is something I'm incredibly proud of. I'm confident that I've put my best possible thoughts, refined and edited, out there in the world as clearly as I can. The other benefit to writing is that it's mine. I set aside time for myself, as free from distraction as possible, to write. There are times of quiet reflection while I ponder characters, plot decisions, action beats, etc. These projects are a great counterpoint to all of the emails, conference calls, and daily efforts of my day job. It's worth noting that these projects can provide you skills that benefit other areas of your life. There's a mindset that develops from consistently working on hard things, repeatedly solving difficult problems, developing mastery in specific skills, publishing and shipping work with your name on it, and learning the techniques and mental models from other disciplines. And we're going to touch more on this in the fourth strategy. It doesn't matter if you're writing the next Rainy River Bees book, turning wood blocks into gothic candlesticks on a vintage lathe, or maintaining a peaceful garden. Whatever you're into, it's best to have work that challenges you, work that you can do consistently, and most importantly, work that stirs your soul. It's also totally okay and probably even preferable if these projects are different than what pays the bills, that you're not relying on them to eat. 
because that brings pressure and business requirements that risk breaking the balancing nature of these projects. Not to say that I'd mind if a movie studio came for the rights to my intellectual property. I wrote these books that tell stories to the world, and I'd be absolutely thrilled for them to reach a wider audience, not to mention the auxiliary income, but I didn't write books for the money. What I'm trying to say is that the context and the purpose with which you create is vitally important. And don't lose sight of that or the benefits those projects have on helping you live a balanced life. Let's get to the fourth strategy, continuing to learn about technology. Now, when I listed these out earlier, this one is the one that probably stood out as counterintuitive, but it's just as important as the other three. The more you understand about the technology around us, the better able you'll be to manage it. It'll help you be more efficient at utilizing programs. For example, using email rules, creating automation scripts, reducing execution time on work tasks. It's going to help you develop an intuition on how programs and systems work, speeding up the adoption time of new things that you come across. It'll help you become a linchpin within your organization, potentially opening up opportunities for a career advancement that can provide better pay, creating more balance for your preferred lifestyle, and increasing connections with your coworkers, just to name a few. Learning more about technology will also help you properly contextualize the benefits, detriments, and impacts of new technologies, avoiding the fear-mongering, misinformation, and misinformed opinions that are usually associated with new technologies. Or put another way, it's going to help you establish the better filters I mentioned in the second strategy. Face the reality that learning doesn't stop with a diploma or a degree. It should be a lifelong process. You don't need to know every nuance of every technology. Besides being impossible, it's impractical. But there's no shortage of fantastic content out there that can give you benefits such as a working knowledge of how a technology works, summary level analysis or contextualization of what a tech means to a specific industry, learning tips and tricks on how to use the advanced features of hardware and or software that you use on a regular basis. It'll also help you get up to a proficiency with core functions of a new tool faster than your peers. And it's going to help you assess the developments from other industries so you better grasp the methods by which they could impact your own. I'm going to end this episode with a quote from the Stoic philosopher Epictetus. It's not what happens to you, but how you react to it that matters. All right, everybody, have a great day. If you feel that Chris dealt with it, I'd appreciate your support of the show by sharing it with someone who might benefit. Ratings on your favorite podcast player are also helpful in growing the audience. Visit chriscroyder.com for free downloadable PDFs with notes and resources from today's episode, sign up for the CDWI mailing list, or to send in your problems or requests for future shows. That's C-H-R-I-S-K-R-E-U-T-E-R.com, or use the link in the show notes. Thanks for listening to Chris Will Deal With It.